Et on y va. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, little webinar about uh, mastering propionics with pyramics, showing you uh, a few different things. First of all, um, you will obviously hear me if, if something goes wrong or whatever. For example, before I didn't enhance or speak too, too close to my microphone, uh, just write a message or whatever. And if you have a question, please do not hesitate uh, to ask it also over the, the YouTube messaging. And I will then uh, reply either by message or show something or whatever, if it's a question about a specific uh, 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 operation. Um, the idea here is that um, I will um, show you a little bit how, first of all, to import files, uh, different types of files, formats, uh, resolution, sample rates, and so on. And once this is done, then I will play them back, top and tail them, make a little fade if needed. Uh, I will also crossfade if it's needed. And uh, then I will set some markers. And um, of course, this is a workflow. Of course, you can change the order. I mean, this is not relevant in here, but this is the order I will approach it. And then I will put some markers in there. And those markers are at the beginning, like to be able to, for example, uh, set different uh, moments where I would like to add some more compression, just some memory stickers, if you want, for me, for my work. Once I've done this, uh, the interesting thing with those markers is that later on I can use them to implement metadata to make some final export for my final files. And, uh, and so there's a trick and a tricky way to, 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 to use them, which is interesting. Then I will explain the signal flow and the signal path that I have in the Pyramix mixer for summing for bus structures, for plugins, for external inserts, for delay compensation and things like that. And at the end, I will then export and export a few different ways. One would be to make a simple bounce, for example, uh, 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 like a file. The other way would be to re-record something inside the Pyramix mixer or inside, sorry, a Pyramix track. Um, as I would have some external analog gear, for example. Some people work with analog EQs or analog compressors. And uh, for those who have this, this would be a form of workflow. And uh, the other thing is then to make what we call a digital release, including a bounce with all the metadata, including all, of course, the audio material and the metadata, and then from those extract all types of different of file formats might be PCM or um, compressed file formats like uh, uh, FLAC files, or MP3 files, or AC files, and of course, independently of the sample rate. Now, I'm here on a 48K project, obviously, because I'm connected to YouTube to be able to air and broadcast what I'm doing, so I have to have something, a sample rate that YouTube <laughs> understands, but indeed, I could have a 192 project or a 96 project and so on. So, Let's start. First of all, I'm going to diminish my screen. You've seen me enough now. And uh, I'm going to make myself very small down here. And so you have a good overview of, uh, of the whole pyramid. There we go. So now I'm just going to open my browser. And this browser um, has my different files in there. I mean, I can, I, can, I can go over the server or whatever is required. Oh, could be a bit louder. So what I will do is that I will speak closer to the microphone. For the next webinars, I will ha have to arrange an another microphone because this one is not that great. And um, here I can drag and drop directly different files in my session, in my timeline. And this session, I made it very basic, stereo, in the sense that I'm going to work with stereo material, but of course I could do it differently. But for the moment, I work with stereo material. And I drag and drop just simply a file here, another one there, and why not another one here? And I see already that those different files, if I look at here, the type, I have some MP3, I have some AIFF, I have some WAV file, loads of different stuff that I can just drag and drop and place it in the timeline. So now um, the thing, the idea of that is that um, you can natively play and uh, 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 work with all kinds of file formats. So if I go to my media manager, my media manager is basically a tab 
where I have my different folders I'm working with, and it shows me, this time with loads of information, what type of uh, formats and where they're coming from, names and all, and metadata and all of that. And I see, for example, that all these different files, they're two track, basically they're stereo, but I see here I have different sample rates, 48, 44, 1, and so on. I have different resolutions, 32 bits, some are 16 bits, some are 24 bits. And some have different formats. I have some DOF file, I have some AIFF file, I have some WAVE file, some MP3 file, and so on. Interestingly, this doesn't care. I just drag and drop them, and I can play them back. Or I can, if I want already here, top and tail them, and just bring in this little portion, if I would like to. So if I zoom a little bit in, in here, uh, in this file, for example, or in the next one, I see that I have here a little SR. This tells me actually that this file is actually not in the same sample rate uh, um, than my project, but I still can play it back. And it will SRC this uh, audio in real time while I'm playing, or in, or in the time it needs uh, if I make an export, for example, a bounce or whatever. It will bounce it in the session sample rate and not in the original format of the file. Now, of course, it's totally arguable that in a mastering session, um, I might do the conversion up front before. So I, I, this, I leave it back to you. So some people will do it, some others will do it in the session. This is, this is then more a philosophical question than anything else. So now I have those different files here and I can toggle from one to the other, for example, and I have one there and one there. And I see also that um, in the name, this is my personal settings, in the name of the clip, I have the name of the clip, and then I have peak 0, 1 dB, peak 0 dB, peak, uh, I have to zoom in a little bit in here perhaps to see it a bit better, sorry, like this, uh, when it tells me peak 0 dB, let me get, I know that there is one file where there is a bit more headroom, this is one of those, and if I go in here now, I will see peak on the left channel 10 dB and peak 4.4 dB, minus 4.4 dB on the right channel. So I have constantly this information available and I can say normalize, for example, and I say I normalize now this entire clip or media to minus 0.5 dB so that I still have a little red headroom if I would like to. Or I could select my entire material and do it and it will then do it with the delta of the least uh, smallest peak available and apply it to all the different parts. Or I just can also play back and by right clicking I can then change the game if I want straight away in here to my ears. I have headroom in my mixer and so I can use this mixer, I mean my internal mixer. Good. Now that I've placed a little bit my little things and explained how I can do that, I now have to top and tail them. So I'm going to take this part, for example, and I'm going to go close in here. And I see that because my clip is selected at the top of the clip itself, I have some little dots and those little dots, depending on what I'm doing or where I'm going with my mouse, allow me to trim, for example, or to fade, or to go back to the fade. One thing also is that you see that behind I have this gray kind of little uh, lines. If I trim more, actually it shows me back what is the original media I still have available. This is a functionality, if it bothers me, that I can disable simply by turning it off by saying show media off and now it doesn't show it anymore. So some people would like it because they know basically the flesh they have available still uh, for that. And then each time, this is the way I arrange my windows at the bottom here, I have my fade editor open. And this fade editor is basically showing in a form of a zoom, so to say, what it looks like. So now if I make it longer, it will make it in real time longer down here, but here now I can change the curve, for example. Then I can make something very uh, whatever, uh, which is my own. Or I can recall different curves, which are in here. It will just be uh, uh, hidden by my little picture, but obviously it's just a load curve and you have the classic curves like linear and, and all these type of things. And uh, once I've done this, I then can listen to it. And I can say, actually, there is a loop. And because this is how it's set up. And I can say, I want it actually.
interesting way, and it's of course a bit extreme what I've done, but so you could hear what I can do, what I can do. And those fades can be tremendously, tremendously precise in exactly how you want to start and where you want to start it. Good. Now this fade, for example, is a fantastic fade in its length and its curve that I love. And I know I'm going to use it later on. So in the same menu where I was before, I can save it. And I'm going to call it uh, Dennis. Because Dennis is following us. I give this little name in there to this fade. And I can open it. Uh, I have here a little fade library. This fade library is very interesting. When I do some mastering, I can have this open and I have different types of fades in there that I saved with my previous jobs, with my previous uh, work and so on. Of course, I can delete them if I have some that I, I dislike or I'm bored with it. But then I can just drag and drop it. And when I drag and drop it, it means it will drag exactly, for instance, here in this example, the same length with the curve I, did, I just did, either the fade in or the fade out. So this is a tremendous uh, uh, gain in time doing that. And then I would just have to trim it to adjust uh, 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 the proper beginning or the proper end. Then the nice thing uh, is doing, for example, a crossfade. So if I do a crossfade here, I'm gonna do a split over there. And if I drag just this guy over it, it's just gonna override it. But if I hold control, I then can bring it inside and it makes my little crossfade. And here I see that instantly if I click on it, it will show my crossfade. It will just show the two tracks because this is how I set it up. But of course, if I want, I can go into my settings and I can say, actually, I want to say, I want to see two tracks rather than one track. But if I'm multi-track or already two tracks, it's much, in my opinion, much nicer to see that way. But then you can scroll down with the mouse to see the left and the right track on that way. Good. Now here, independently, I can change the length. You would have understood that in my timeline I can make a nice fade, but it will do it to a certain extent, approximately, or at least as best in the zoom that I have. But here now I can really go inside and fiddle in exactly what I need with the curve I need and with the length of the in and the out I want. And on the top of it, I can, of course, slide my media also, because that could be something in terms of written or applause, if you do something live or whatever, something that would need to stick together. So this is a nice little way of showing the basic editing, how you would put things together and how you would move them, move them together. Good. Now, one thing I haven't done, and I will do that now, I should have done it before the editing, editing but it doesn't matter, is that I like putting markers. So I know uh, where I am, how to go back and forth, how to listen to this, to that. So I just say this one is actually my song one. And I just toggle from one uh, edit or rather from one song to another. And I can even change the color if I want to and go here, and this is now my song three. And you remember at the very beginning, I told you that those markers are not only useful now, they will be useful later. Now, very simple, I can go from one song, I can apply a shortcut, of course, to that, but I show you with the mouse, I can go from one song to another. So it means that during playback, whoops, just have to click that, during playback, I can also quickly go there, because I want to play this, or Again, at the beginning, on our song 3, for example, this is one thing. And while I'm listening to it, and I say, actually, on that part, it needs more pressure, plus, plus, plus. So I can also make remarks of what I'm listening to, whatever, and then jump back to that. And here, perhaps, why not uh, some EQ? Uh, around 2k, I mean, just out of, out, of, out of the green line. Okay. Now, those markers, of course, uh, again, I can quickly go, just can move my library, I'll close my library. I can quickly, excuse me, I can quickly move those markers here and go from one to the other. Or I have also in my tabs something, this was the media manager something called the marker list, and I can here very quickly go from one to the other, and here this is actually where I can change the names, 
I can change uh, the colors and I can apply some shortcuts to it and so on and so on and so on. But you will see later on, this is also from where I will be able to make them those markers uh, as PQs to be able to make my exports. Good. Now I'm going to bring you a little bit as I have those four strips here and my fifth strips called mix or master at the bottom. I'm going to show you a little bit what happens in my signal path and all of that. So obviously you've understood that uh, I play my strip, my stereo strip one, or my track edit track one, sorry, on the top, and it plays in my strip one. And here's my strip two, and there's my strip three. Good. Now I'm going to mute all of that. I go into my monitoring section that I'm going to explain a little bit later. I'm going to mute all of that, so because I'm going to initiate a generator so that we can uh, 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 discuss without having uh, some, some ugly noise in our ears. Uh, uh, and I can explain you how this works. Good. So you see that on my strip number one, I have my input uh, of the generator. And by the way, this is here at the bottom where you can also select my physical input if by, by whatever for, for reason you need to record something. Then I have my signal here, my phase invert, my solos and mutes and so on, and obviously my gain, but the click goes back to zero. My EQs, my plugins and so on, I come to these plugins a little bit later. Now the thing is that you see that I have some colors here at the top. I prepared, of course, a little bit this session to be able to explain it to you, but so that you understand the concept and then can recreate it or use it in that way. I have those green colors and this kind of uh, brownish, uh, salmonish color, and then those blue ones. And this is obviously in which buses I've selected this sound here. It means they all, the four first uh, strips here, go to the green bus. And the green bus on the right side, these are my buses. So I have four buses. And actually, I have two group buses and two mixed buses. You'll understand the difference in a second. But for the moment, I send this one here in my green bus. And this green bus is a, what we call a stereo mixed group. All is stereo on that mixer for the moment, but I could do 5.1 or 7.1 or 22.2 or whatever, but let's make it easy for the moment. So uh, um, it's a stereo uh, group. And a group, if I go here at the bottom of this uh, bus, contrary to the strips where I have inputs, I could have outputs. I have outputs actually here on my mixed buses that you see here, I can connect an output. But here there's an arrow saying it's a send return. It is actually a send return where I can sum different things together. It could be plugins also that I could add, but for the moment, there are things summed together so that all those four strips go summed into my green bus. And this green bus is going to blue, and blue is this one. I agree the blue is not exactly the same, but let's say it is the same. Uh, this blue here, and this goes out there now. And now this goes physically out to what we call an internal bus. So this could be, for example, where I will connect my analog EQ, for example, or my analog chain that would go out here and that would come back to this strip that I will record down here. And for the moment, I didn't activate it. But when I activate it, I will see now my incoming signal as the internal bus is connected here. And now I send it to my master final bus number two and out there. Okay. So now I'm going to do one thing. For whatever reason, I'm saying, and this is where the signal path becomes very interesting. I'm going to say, oh, actually, for an effect reason in my song as a live stream, I would like, for example, let's say that we work with some analog gear in the lower frequencies, and then, but then you want to sum everything back together. So I would, for example, say, here, if I click on there, I can choose to which buses I send all of this signal. So I could say I would actually send it to the M2. The M2 is the beige output final bus. Um, and I send it together. And now I say that I send it here and there. So it splits the colors and I can see nicely the way it goes. So now you would say, yeah, okay, that's fine. But what about latency? Sorry, what about delay compensation in this aspect? Not latency compensation to avoid latency obviously from one signal to the other and I see that my final bus I have the summing of those two signals and next to it you see this little green bead that means that my mixer is actually 
uh, delay compensating all my mixture properly. And you will notice that if I remove this again, it will blink for a second, go red and go green again. And doing it back, it will blink again, it goes very fast and, and, and do it again. That means that during that time, it automatically compensates the delay from my signal going through all my chain and my other same signal going directly to the connector, right? So it means that constantly, unless I have an option to disable this automatic delay compensation, but constantly I'm in my, I'm, I'm compensating my delay and I can work sample accurate and have a peace in mind on the, on the last step. Good. Now I could do the same, of course, and say, I want to send this now to my group here. And so I send it to these two together and here do the same, send it uh, to this group and that group. And again, it delay compensates. So wherever I'm doing it, it will be possible. Good. Now, how, I mean, these colors are nice, but if I now expand this, this now uh, leads me to explain you a little bit how this whole structure functions. So, you see, coming back to my script number one, I have panners, I'm going to talk about this panning a little bit later. So I'm going to jump over to here. So this is the expansion, and this is where I added the colors. Huh? I can change the colors on those little minus, minuses and, and choose a nicer color than this, or whatever your own color scheme you can, you can use or you prefer. Good. Now, all of those are on router, and basically when they're ticked like this, it means that they're active, okay, or deactive. And you see that below I have this little grid. When I click on this grid, it opens basically a channel routing from my in and my output. So basically my strip input, what it provides and what the bus wants. So obviously now I'm going from stereo strip to a stereo bus. So not much to do. It says left channel full, right channel full. I mean zero dB and that's fine. But of course I could change it if I would like to change it, okay, like this. But now if I would go from a mono channel, for example, to a stereo uh, channel, then it would automatically put minus three and minus three on the left and on the right channel that I could modify, of course, but this is how it's done automatically. So this is in the concept and the aspect that in my mastering, I don't want to touch the panning because that's the artist who did it. But often there might be some things to do. So I could say, okay, now I don't want to use the router. I actually want to use the panel one. And the panel one is this panel here. The panel two is the panel below. I can implement as many patterns as I want. You, you will see they're independent. It's actually an independent object of my mixer that makes it very versatile. You will understand why. So now this is my panel one and I have a stereo panel. And this time I can pan my signal left and right. So obviously because I sum it, it's not so perceivable. So now I make it very clear left and right. Okay. I double click, go back in the middle. Now, what is interesting, because it's a stereo signal, I can say I want it a pan balance. So it's really a pan balance as we used to know it in most of the mixers. But I have also one that I can manage independently my left and my right channel. Okay. So this makes it very interesting to um, fine tune some, some errors, some padding errors that might have been established during the mix. Or last but not least, I can also go into the signal pan. And now it's like a stereo signal that remains always at 60 degrees and that I move from left to right, of course, without the possibility to go into, it, to, into the extremes. I see it over here, contrary to standard panner, what is called the balance panner, where I can really completely eliminate one side of the signal, for example. Now, Remember, I could route this guy to uh, the pink one as well, and perhaps because the process needs a different process depending the pattern, I could say that here I remain with router, so now this is different, you see, this is not affected because of the router, but if I say if it's panel one, it will be affected. That's perhaps what you want, but perhaps you want another panel. So I added a second panel already, and I say now this one is pan two. So this will affect my green one, and this is my green bus, and this one will affect my pink bus. Okay, and then they're back summed together. 
So you can really make some very subtle uh, summing in that aspect that are very interesting. So how do I change all of that? And how do I add a pattern or add a bus? It's a very, very basic. I right click, like in most of <laughs> all the DPWs, I say add, this is for strips. So mono, stereo, MS, and then multi-channel strips. And I can go from stereo to all the immersive formats to 22.2 and ambisonic inputs up. So you have a, a, a certain amount of freedom <laughs> doing whatever you want. Same idea on the outputs or on the buses rather, bus, add, general mixing bus. And you see just below here, padding control bus. So I can add those control bus as many as I want independent of the mixers buses. So here, this is my gen creating new general mixing bus. As I said before, I can create buses or groups. The mix bus is a physical output, the mix group being a sent return. And then in the auxiliaries, for example, now if I would like to add a reverb, or if I'm, I'm in another type of configuration, like non mastering, I have somebody in the booth or whatever, and I will need to send a cue or a headphone or whatever it is. And uh, object buses as well for immersive productions or object based productions. And again, from stereo up to uh, 714, passing all the immersive uh, formats, oro and so on, and so on, 22.2. And of course, ambisonic up to the seventh order. So for VR productions and also for uh, binaural productions, but I'm not talking about this now here, it's going to be uh, for another webinar. Good. Why is it so important having an independent? Panner or a panner as an object and not linked to a bus. Because now in my production, some, suddenly the producer or whoever comes or the customer and says, Oh, look, this is open now in the other window. I'm going to bring it back to your screen. Look, this is actually now a stereo production and we can make it 5 1. We received an extra budget or we need to do 5 1 now or 7 1 or whatever it is. And you can modify the bus into another type of uh, format without losing the panic. So this is key. You can go one way or the other and you're going to lose rather gain, sorry, a lot of time doing that in the sense that you can modify your mixer, your bus structure without modifying your panner as they are not linked to the bus and they are just an object. The remote control of that if you wish. So good. Let me go back to the router. There's a last thing I want to show. Let me show this again. So this is now nice and neat with the colors. You see probably how it works. One thing that is very important is that next to the mixer, I have a monitoring section. And this monitoring section is obviously key to listen to the different things and the way I need to work with it. So as we have constructed, or they are already ready, but those four buses here, you find them again in my monitoring section there. So I have my master bus one, my master bus two, and my two groups. And obviously I can listen to them. So I could listen to, to, to just the mix group one, just the mix group two, and of course, if I rename them here, I call this 445, it's gonna rename them there so that you don't get lost with the different namings and all of that. And if you deploy it, you could also make a little, with a control button, say that control left, control right, so that now you listen to the left of the, of the group two and the right of the group one, for example. So you can really use this as a monitoring section. So this is the selection of your sources. And then if you click configure, this is basically where you set up all your different speaker sets or headphones or whatever, if it's stereo, but speaker sets if it's multi-channel. Uh, the different outputs and so on and so on. If you click back on monitor, that means they will appear here and you can then toggle through different speaker sets going from one to the other and go through the down mixes. And then of course you can mute the speaker, phase invert the speaker, if I click phase, it's going to invert the phase and so on and so on. Another very interesting thing, externals, you can add here some external inputs. That means that typically in the mastering thing, the customer comes with a DVD if he still comes to your place or you just play back something from the computer that you connect here, you then listen to what you have on the computer or what is feedback through whatever input you have and you mix. So you can 
go back and forth and you don't need to mess around with a strip and doing all of that. It's ready in here. And last but not least, in my monitoring section, I have a talkback section where I can set up different talkbacks, not very useful for mastering, but obviously very useful for other applications. Good. And the master volume with a double click going back to a reference volume that I can manage the way I want. And I'm going to disable the generator and unmute that so that we can hear some audio. So finally, um, just one thing about plugins. This is here where my, I can add some different plugins. So same idea like everywhere else. I right click BS3 plugins on my own plugins, or when I say own plugins, it's Merging's uh, own platform uh, or Pyramid's own platform. We have our own plugins and there's some other plugin manufacturer uh, things in there. And we have, of course, VST. And then you have uh, yellow, exactly what I didn't want you to do. You have some uh, yellow dots here. This is basically on off and this is then on pass. So you click on the on the name and it shows your five band uh, uh, linear EQ, for example, phase linear EQ. And you can bypass it if you want to by keeping the delay compensation and the yellow one is without the delay compensation. This is of course uh, more important if you work with uh, 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 um, uh, restoration plugins, for example, that will then increase a lot of uh, delay in your process. Good. Now, the interesting thing is that, uh, let me just push a little bit of volume uh, don't hear it that loud. And then it goes in here, and of course, I can then activate, for example, my multi mount. It's not a multi mount, sorry, it's a compressor, decompressor, expander, and de expander, very nice for plugs. I'm not going to explain what the plugins now because that's not the purpose. But I'm just going to do over the head roll. I have a pure limiter, for example, and then I have a clap filter, and all of that works nicely over my different buses and sources I put, of course. Now, the interesting thing is that here I have also an external insert. So I could, from there, with physical in and outputs, I could now insert, for example, my analog compressor or EQ that poured back in what I'm just, uh, what I'm just having there and that makes it all nice and neat. Good. Good. So coming to now, so you see I recorded that in real time for those who would like to record. Some people would do it, but uh, this is then your own way of working or your own uh, trademark if you want. <laughs> Good. How do I export all those? Ah, sorry, just forgot one thing, very important. Um, I have here a so-called final check. This final check is basically a metering of my master bus at the moment. Uh, I can select which bus I'm, I'm, I want to listen to. And I have a, a phase correlator, I have a little metroscope, I have BPM, true peak, view meter, and loudest meter that I can start and pause if I need to. And then I have the cell where I can say actually what I want. For example, I'm somebody, I hate BPM, not interested. I don't want to do loudness, not interested. And for example, I could say also that I just want to view the true peak, that's fine. The phase, and I don't want specialization, I don't care, I don't like it. And now it's just very basic. So you can really set it up, and of course with, the, with your own preferences in terms of uh, 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 levels, uh, peak holes, and all these type of things the way you want it. And this is of course crucial uh, uh, when you do mastering to have a proper metering constantly under your eyes. You see also on the right side here, even if I close the mixer, I have what we call a meter bridge, where you, on, where you can see everything what's going on precisely, and you can set it up also in the way you want with, uh, with uh, the colors, uh, when it's over and so on, I mean, for everybody who gets accustomed to what they're doing. Good. Now let's go to the export. As I said at the very beginning, we have a few different possibilities to export audio. One would be very basic in terms of selecting this clip and say mix down. So mix down is basically my bounce tool and I give a name to it. And then I say where I'm gonna put it, the file format, and I can mix down it. Of course, I could say in real time or not with an SRC, if I would like to make 44 ones straight away or 16 bits or whatever it is. And don't forget, I have different types of file formats and different types of 
even some parades and resolutions in my project, and it's sort of define it all back into 48k, for example, because it's the sub of my project. If it would be 96, it would make it in 96, unless I take here and I change something. Now, the very nice thing is that you see that I always have my different mix sources. So I could actually say I would like to make it make a mix before my analog chain and make a mix after my analog chain in one path. And then I say one, code, one file called DOS, so that I make a stereo file for each of them, and I don't need to do it twice, I just do it once and we're done. Okay, so this is one way of exporting, which is very nice. There are other features in there, but fortunately time is a, a bit limited. The other way is then using my markers. As you remember, we have those markers up there that we set earlier at the very beginning, and I go into my marker list, and I select them. Shift, click, or go. And now that they're selected, whoops, I just want to fix this window so that it doesn't disappear anymore, and I have to reselect them. <laughs> there we go. Right click, and I say create CD disk. So that always makes me laugh because that sounds a little bit old style. CD disk is basically my CD as a CD tab window, is basically what helps me to implement my tracks. Where do they start? Where do they stop? Uh, and for the moment, I put some C, what we call CDPQ markers. Let's put it down like this. Exactly where my markers are, my previous markers. And you see those one, two, three, four, and so on. And it puts some stop markers at the end of it. Uh, if I zoom a little bit in, you will see that there will be some start marker here. And oh, sorry, it didn't put any stop markers. It's at the very end. You will see it there. Where there is a stop marker here at the end, and that I can move if I want. Also, uh, 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 each marker can be moved like this in the timeline if necessary. So now, obviously, it took the song, but it took also my remarks that I had before. For example, my compression and my EQ. And actually, this is I don't need that. So and I don't want that. So I can say delete the marker and delete the marker here. Um, there we go. And now they remain as the static markers as I had before, but I just have three songs. This is exactly what I want. Now, last but not least, also here I can say actually the pause in between are zero frames. This is something I don't want. I want to add four frames, for example. And now I see that it edited it straight away in there uh, uh, and added a stop marker. And I can fine tune, obviously, different things like that. And now, very interesting, I have here all my information about this disk. First of all, the title. So I call it, I don't know, uh, uh, 6 p.m. As for me, it is, it is a 6 p.m. task. Uh, I can say, um, I can change here, for example, the disk title. So I type something like performer me, be very original, songwriter, not me. And then the composer, uh, you, and so on. Once I've done all of that, I can then tick or click and select and right click. And I have here the CD text. And now the CD text proposes me to set all track CD from this info. And of course, I deselected it by mistake by touching my keyboard. It's exactly what I didn't want. There we go, CD text set all CD from this info. So now it took everything and added it straight away here from what I filled in here at the bottom. And the same thing is, uh, excuse me, CD text, set track from track name. And now the CD text title, song one, two, three. And the same thing, for example, for the ICRC code. So here before in some menus, I can make default ICRC code from the country I am, or, or my, 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 my country code, sorry, or my producer code, or whatever it is. Uh, and of course, I can modify, increment them, and so on. But now I can individually click and select them again and say, actually, the CD text performer is not only me on that song, it's also you. So I can modify, of course, individually things uh, the way I want. Oh, yeah, and I forgot the genre. So this is alternative, whatever. This is acid punk, and this is, let's choose something with not an A. This is some for me. Okay, 
So now I have uh, my three songs ready with my metadata with some markers. And now the concept in pyramids is that obviously I can do a CD from that. But today I know still people do quite a lot, do still some CDs and do some DVPs, but most of the people are asked to do actually multiple formats, multiple format files and perhaps a CD and a DVP. So we have thought that one cool way is actually what we call the generate master is to do a master file and this master file will then include all the metadata we've done, uh, make a down mix from that to a stereo. I mean, this is because the mixer is a stereo output, so it's only a stereo file. But what we call a digital release. And this digital release will be now, it's the sub rate of the project. As I said, I'm in 48K because I have to connect to YouTube to be able to hear and so on. The, the input or the stuff from the, the project. But if I would work with my with my Anubis and and, 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 and play like that, I would work in 96 or 192K or whatever it is in a mastering session and keep it that way. So in the digital release, I always keep it in the highest separate I want in the highest resolution of my raw original material. Uh, or as I said, I can do a red book image straight away. I can also do a DSD edit master and digital release. We're not talking about DSD here because that's a completely different uh, 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 workflow and, and concept. We can have this on, a, on another webinar, perhaps, if you wish. But for the moment, let's do a P PCM digital release. The name, my location, where it's going to exist, and here, which bus I want to take as a source to be able to create it. Now, very interestingly, I have a function called album publishing. I go on settings and those settings tell me that, yes, you certainly want to do this digital release, basically this bounds adding metadata. But then from this original file format, sorry, from this original mix file, I can then extract all loads of different formats and file formats and sample rates and resolutions and so on. So I could say, yes, I want some MP3 and 44 one, but I can say whatever, I want some AIFF, sorry, some AIFF in 48, because we're 48. Uh, I even can make some post SRC gain, depending for different uh, platforms. Spotify doesn't require the same, the same as Apple, and so on and so on. Uh, I say, okay, and then I can choose which files I want to do in this process, or none. For the moment here, I choose none. And by, sorry, by the way, this is how below I choose what met metadata I want to include in the file. So here, this is where I say, oh, I would like to have the composer and the uh, file format and so on and so on. And you can also make different files and send them into different folders so that they are nicely neatly arranged all together. But now I, I selected none. And I could say album publishing none, and I start, and I just create this PCM digital release. Because on a later stage, I still don't know what my customer doesn't want. He, he calls me in two weeks and tells me, okay, I would like to have now this and this file format. And later on, he calls again uh, 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 and says, um, yeah, I want another file format again, or I want a CD. So here you can recall your digital release and uh, once you recall the digital release you can then uh, make those different uh, selections so here we go you go set up and launch and from here now you can say what different types of file formats you can do and if you have done for example a digital release in 96k 24 bit and finally your customer asks oh but i absolutely need a cd okay fine you do a cd and uh, you change your separate, well, it's 16 bit 24, uh, 40, sorry, 16 bit 44, excuse me, and you make your image CD and then you open your disk, right, and you can run it. So, this is basically the workflow. The disk, right, is a tool to be able to burn your final CD if you still want to do that. It appears on the other screen, so I'm just going to bring it over in a second. Uh, you can burn it to a CD or 
you can make the generate the DDP out of this CD image. So basically, to generate a DDP, you have to open a disk image, which I have here, and then yes, no, okay. And then here you have the DDP folder, and you select a different target, basically, and you select the DDP folder, and you generate the DDP. So this is basically all the different possibilities you have uh, in Pyramix generating your master files. And what is key, and I'm going to come back to you like this, what is key, I find, and many people do find, is that um, you do your job once. You create your master file once, you implement your metadata once, and then you can always export it today or on a later stage. And one thing, bye-bye, I, <laughs> I close myself again. One thing I forgot to show is just quickly in here, let's say in a year you need to do a compilation, you just import the PCM digital release back as an import project, and it will add all the metadata, all the PQ markers, and then you uh, choose just the songs or the metadata you need, and you do your new work. But you, you gain a tremendous amount of time in that to be able to do all of that. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for listening. hope uh, it was interesting for you, and uh, stay tuned. There will be a few other webinars in the coming weeks. Bye-bye.